Welcome back. It's a great pleasure to reintroduce um, a UC Parika, whom I've known and admired for many, many years. And if I could have a bit of a, of a teacher pride and watch him grow to greater and greater heights um, with every new book. Originally from Finland, and he still teaches at the University of Turku, Yusuf Parika has been working out of the UK for many years. He's currently lecturing at the Winchester School of Arts at the University of Southampton. Uh, many books, um, all of them absolutely a must. Um, digital Contagions 2007, Insect Media 2010, What is Media Archaeology 2012, and the latest, which we're launching today, A Geology of Media. A man who knows everything but is very, very delicate and, uh, and gen gentle uh, about it. Uh, I suppose the title is still the same, though knowing you, you probably have changed it, but it used to be a molecular aesthetic, Smog Media Cities and Decapitalocene. The new title is No Man's, no Man's Land. Land. I knew it. Welcome the Insect Media Geology of Media ah. guy. You see. <laughs> Oi. Thank you very much, Rosie. Are we on with this? Yeah, I think we are. I need to just get it a bit higher. Otherwise, my back is going to be bad. How's this? Um, yes. Thank you for having me. It's truly a pleasure. Thank you, you two organizers and everybody. Um, um, and it's really um, a fantastic series of talks. It's a fantastic project. The glossary is something that I really feel um, I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful to be part of. And I'm hoping that, as, as was kind of also hinting, I guess, what the idea is that we work on the topics collectively. We shouldn't be only kind of a, you know, mentioning this politics political theme in terms of theme, but actually work on these concepts that we want to raise and develop collectively, as we did with Tim's paper already. We started pinpointing themes that we find as a collective interest and uh, how they ecologically overlap from art practices and aesthetics to ecology and environment, and in this case also media. Um, I apologize because I changed my title. Um, I felt First, that I want to talk about the specific way of understanding um, notions of visual culture in relation to urban environments and the notion of smog. Well, actually, not the notion of smog, but actual smog that you inhale, which would have also tied with Tim's paper as well of kind of a time, trying to understand what is the contemporary moment. Visual, but also atmospheric culture, that is something that we don't see only. Well, smog is a visual cultural phenomenon, um, but also something we inhale, and that is a very concrete, let's say, biopolitical environment in which we are trying to survive, and that characterizes increasing our lives in urban environments, especially. But I'm not going to be talking about that, but perhaps we can, it might be something we want to raise in the later discussion. Um, instead, I'm going to be talking something directly related to the geology of media. The book that we are launching, um, so in a way my talk might be quite a good introduction to the book as well, even if the talk itself is not directly from the book. It just taps into the same themes and something that I felt is rather relevant for today's theme, Anthropocene, Capitalocene. Okay? Even if for me in the project and in my work, I kind of realized that I never really wanted to start with the notion of the Anthropocene. It's not been the thing that drove to think about, let's say, geology or media. Even if the resonances are very clear, and even if um, I'm going to mention it a couple of times, and even if I, I kind of make the rather silly pun of Anthropocene in that little booklet that I, I sent through as well, but it, you got a sense of sense of my argument there. Um, so this is development of some of those themes. And uh, I was also thinking that, it, for the sake of time, I'm going to cut out the last section, which is on art. But to be honest, even if it might take a couple of extra minutes, I think we, I could talk it through, because it relates to what Tim talked about and relates to those themes. And it might raise more thoughts on this connection between um, materiality and media, politics, Anthropocene and art, right? So my talk is going to be very much of a talk, um, but, but, but we have plenty of time for questions as well and discussion. And I'll start with an art project. So sometimes, and some of the images in general are, are just background. 
but I'll speak to some of the images as well, even if this piece is, is our kickoff. As part of a selection of works from the third and fourth Janakkale Biennale, Janakkale, Turkey, Güven in Girliolus, Hertaraf, No Man's Land, from 2014, sits as a commentary about the Gallipoli campaign, also known as the Dardanelle campaign of First World War. Now, 100 years after the First World War, or commemorating its start, almost exactly 100 years after the start of the naval assault by Britain and France on 25th April 1915, the work sits as part of a memory. Memory of the war, memory of its devastation. And what I realized also listening to Sim is that it's about beaches. Beaches are the place where assault, naval assaults happen or landings happen. This sort of a 20th century urban ge uh, uh, geography, not urban geography, geography of war, but also um, 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 geopolitics, right? So the beach is very loaded in so many ways, in so many themes that relate to war, military technology, and uh, of course, Anthropocene. This piece, image installation, digital image installation, um, is part of a commemoration of the war as an event. An event of technological warfare, of massive ecological scales, less a celebration of the Ottoman victory than a more subtle sort of a memory that entangles social history and natural history. Despite the silence, the silence that seeps through the gallery, in the gallery, through also the digital images placed on the walls of Depot Gallery in Istanbul, where I encountered the piece. In Girliolo's installation of images, it's described as a commentary on the two times, or the two times of human life and the time of nature, histories and times, as he describes it. There is not only 100 years since um, since these events, but multiple ways of narrating and recording the passing of time, multiple times how it unfolds in the psychology, an ecology of time. Of course, no man's land refers to the contested zone between trenches that during the long months until January 16 changed occupation many times, leaving behind an odd sort of a memory. There's nothing new in the morning of the 20th century through its ruins. We talk of bunker archaeology. Look at 20th century his social history through its military architectures. But Inchirliol is keen to extend from the social and human history to that of soil. The photographic installation seems to be talking of the chemical traces of dead bodies, body parts, barbed wire, gun shells, mines, dead trees, flora. It's a natural history. But it's a natural history of the intensity of the war that was then localized back in Janakkale in Turkey. The geopolitical aim, which was escorted by utterly bad intelligence by the British troops, which led to the failure of the campaign, at least from British British point of view, the geopolitical aim of landing through Janakkale was to reach Constantinople. It never succeeded according to the plans, but the geophysical legacy of the warfare of such warfare in the age of technological advanced machinery left a rather concrete trace in the soil, a trace that troubles our notions of history, but also of time, and how we think of these themes in the context of Anthropocene. In Girliolo's meditation is part of the memorization of the war 100 years later, but it also includes a tra trajectory, a global perspective. He continues almost by way of a media archaeology of technical war, in his words, I quote, Today it, pos it is possible to say that the global state of war that also encompasses the biosphere has been going on for a century. He continues referring to the annihilation of masses in the Middle East, Africa, Asia, an extension of the continued war. And on the other hand, the total destruction of human habitats, rivers, forests, and the biological mineral world is being processed on by the neoliberal policies worldwide. And he continues, in this context, today's Istanbul's northern forests, quarries, African gold mines, vast territories of fracking in Canada, and all other sites of destruction resemble the scene of no man's land. He's talking about war 
100 years ago, but it's a war that never finished, a continuous war that is waged not only between the two rivaling parties. A war that was not merely ideological, perhaps, but geopolitical, in a rather fundamental sense, and never really involved these two sides of troops in trenches. Thomas Pynchon once suggested about the Second World War, in a rather provocative take, that perhaps it wasn't political only in the sense that we usually think of it as the political war. Perhaps the ideological was only to keep people distracted, that the crises were on a different level of allocations and priorities, a material history of technologies and plastics, electronics, aircrafts, and their needs. This comes from Gravity's Rainbow, of course, from 1973. And perhaps it, instead of this Gravity's Rainbow narrative, it was the soil, nature, and the chemical residue that stayed. And the chemical pollution that keeps on dispossessing certain human groups, as much as various species, and the biosphere in this extended ongoing warfare. What's more and crucial is that this dispossession is not merely about the human, of course. It's more emphasized in certain areas of the global south, indigenous areas, and of course, with gendered variations. A point that needs to be borne in mind as a way to qualify the Anthropocene, not merely as the Anthropos, but the rather unevenly distributed waste load of the political economic system, capitalocene. It has been suggested, after all, only recently, by the Anthropocene Working Group that perhaps we should consider the first nuclear explosion as the marker of the great acceleration since mid 20th century, leaving its artificial radionuclide as a trace or a stratigraphic boundary that is measurable through the radioisotopes in ice and across continents. The Anthrop Anthropocene is such a conflation of natural history and human history, we've known this for several years of the debate. But it also signals a similar story itself, where the technological warfare opens through a narrative of 20th century war recorded in chemical traces. Also that nuclear research, nuclear research was itself instrumental in the emerging climate research of the Cold War period. But also, one could go back. One could narrate different stories of war and conquest. To narrate stories of colonialism, such as the Spanish invasion of Inca lands and their mines, processing silver from lead since the mid-16th century, way before the official start of how we usually narrate industrial revolution, but something that is now traceable through chemical readings in the Cuelcaya ice cap in Peru. In other words, of course, and it's a banal point, but it needs to be repeated, the whole idea of a human history is problematized both in terms of the ethnicities, the colonialist legacies, gender, and other sorts of critiques that underpin what do we mean by Anthropos. Number two, about materiality of media, or rather concretely materials of media. Well, war is a rather apt, but at the same time rather well used and often used starting point for the meditation having to do with media technological materiality. There is something of a bit of troubling nature there. It is inspiring, but also troubling. The references to pension as well as history of the military and war are abundant in accounts such as Friedrich Hitler's, whose media theoretical insight into history was often, most often bound together with the evaluation of the role of the military-industrial complex. In these accounts, military investment, engineering and scientific contexts were seen as an acceleration of media historical direction in alternative ways. That of technological development then only trickled down that then only trickled down to civil sphere as entertainment and everyday gadgets and signal capacities. Huts of Pletchley Park, rocket sized at Penamunde, abandoned radio stations, bunkers are ruins of near historical significance. And reminders of original sites where media technologies take place. Computers, rockets, advanced mathematics employed as part of the war effort, giving us later civilian uses of different audio and visual hardware, wireless communication and signal frequency hopping, and so forth. Hence, 
it is clear that if we start from a rather environmental point of view and narrate an environmental history of media materiality, we present an alternative, at times complementary, at times diverting idea. Meditations of war have gradually turned to meditations concerning the more generalized war, at, that at times we refer by the name of Anthropocene. At times, we just talk about the mass extension of species underway. This theme and the art installation we started with is also a good example of the gradual shift of cultural heritage discourse from a focus on humans, human ruins, and official institutions of memory such as archives, museums, libraries, those of natural formations. We don't talk about history only in relation to the archival in that way, but we talk about the his historical in relation to, well, natural formations, chemical traces, biosphere, anthropocene. Memory becomes only one formation of ecological subjectivity that doesn't necessarily return back to reinforce a sense of anthropocentric sense of individuality or even sometimes human-centered collectivity. But it's something of an impulse that forces us to consider the conditions in which it takes place. What is it that makes memory possible? It is in this context that the proposition of geology of media works to extend what we mean by media materiality, but also time, not only history, but also time in a radical way. It's also an extension of the normal focus on social histories of human media. This is where Marshall McClure and I take different directions. Instead of talking about media as extensions of man, we need to recognize media as extensions of various kinds. This is a recognition that already some of the land art, earth arts, um, since 1960s were proposing. Robert Smithson's work very concretely and in one passage as well said it's directly that instead of McLuhan root of media as extensions of man, we need to talk about media as extensions of, of, of the elemental. And we need to understand the elemental here in a very concrete sense, even so concrete to refer to that table, the periodic table. This sort of an alternative scheme is more about media that is composed of the geophysical on, an, on a chemical level. Not merely the soil, of course, but more concretely the minerals and energies that are necessary to run the high-tech computational processes that constitute this sort of a planetary level. submarine cable networks as an example of the planetary scale projects that at the same time follow earlier historical lineages and geopolitical lineages as well. It is a focus on the longer term mineral constitution of media, not merely coal sand that has made it as part of the extended vocabulary of cultural theory but also other sorts of minerals and metals that are directly or indirectly part of media and technological culture. Large amounts of tin, cobalt, palladium, silver, gold, copper go to media technologies. We know the stories about copper, how essential it was to establish the early 19th century or since mid 19th century, the global sense of information culture or network culture. A computer chip is another story that we might worth while mentioning. Computer chip itself is sort of a mini mine. It demands about 60 different materials and minerals in its construction, a fact that is recognized in increasing amount of national security reports over the past 10 years. Again, in terms of production of the knowledge that we see as relevant for our critical theory or cultural theory perspectives, we need to be also recognizing who else is talking about this. And it is quite often national security agencies in relation to mineral needs of nation states and other sorts of organizations. So the post-World War II situation of reconstruction and Cold War was in many ways a story about this already. It was already in many ways a story about the management of energy and mineral resources. In the 1970s, especially from the US and allied perspective, this related to what was referred to as the short and long-term reliability and availability of foreign sources of oil and other energy and non-fuel mineral resources, such as bauxite and cobalt. In many ways, it's possible to talk about this as the extended Cold War. An extended Cold War that's also never really finished. Something that 
scholars like my colleague Ryan Bishop have been arguing. Of course, it's very clear when one looks at what's happening in Europe and on the borders of Europe, the maneuvers of the still rather significant military powers such as US and Russia, the urgency of materials, minerals and energy for technological society is part of security agendas that ties up a variety of other levels of states, organizations, corporations as part of this extended security focused geopolitics a geopolitics of energy and minerals. In other words, the global nature of the non-fuel mineral market and the increasing demand in China, India, etc., has mobilized a sense of urgency and emergency that ranges from the availability of coal sand for playstations and mobiles to the wider sense of infra infrastructural dependency that reveals a longer, deeper, mineral constitution of media. Scholars over the recent years have been, in a way, recognizing the situation um, in terms of, let's say, a shift in media and film studies from eco-critique of representations to an eco-critique that talks about what makes representations and media possible. I'm thinking of people like Sean Cupid, but also Jennifer Gabris, for instance, in their work. Sean Cupid has been inspiring in talking about the need for a refined look at hardware. Quite a lot of our critique of, let's say, German media theory was for a good reason, arguing that it was too much focused on technological determinism and hardware. But at the same time, we might need to revisit this, but with a sensitivity to the post-colonial and neo-colonial arrangements that um, are part of this hardware, hardware um, situation. The neo-colonial eco-politics of resource extraction that hit hardest, usually indigenous people. We can continue such a line of thought to talk of the geophysics of media technologies as the true geos of geopolitics. The massive change from primary reliance on a few key materials just over 100 years ago, it was mostly wood, brick, iron, copper, gold, silver, and of course, gradually over the 20th century, emergence of plastics as part of consumer society and, let's say, broadly speaking, technological society. And how this has been complemented by this meticulous production, refinement and standardization of this minuscule elemental chemistry, not least minerals, that are crucial for the microchipped technological society. I might return to that point a bit later with an example from Apple. But I'll talk, because I know that not everybody, I'll talk through the deep time of media idea, even if you've got the text in where I kind of talk about deep time, but I'll just go through some key things and how they escort us back to thinking about this materiality and its relation to um, neo-colonialism and so forth. So obviously the key question is, what does it mean for media studies? What does it mean for media theory? What does it mean to the post-colonial um, 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 cultural theory in a variety of fields that we work in. How do we respond to the situation where we talked about these notions of death and surface, water, elementals, um, the return of not only four elements, but the dozens and dozens of hundreds of elements in the periodic table? What does that mean in terms of the vocabularies of critical theory and these glossaries as well? The multiplicity of geopolitical materialities that are the historical infrastructural layer around which questions of media materiality have to refocus. How do we acknowledge this long trail, this long trail of media materiality that extends much outside the machines to the networks, infrastructure, but even planetary materialities that are necessary for media to even become media? So the notion of media, uh, deep time of media, was already incorporated as part of media studies by Siegfried Zielinski, the Berlin-placed um, media historian, um, variantologist, or media archaeologist. Um, he used the notion, well, he borrowed, of course, the notion of deep time from geology and takes it as a media historical concept. Um, in short, his well-known account in how to think about these lineages between art and science outside the very short span focus in contemporary media are seen into kind of long durations of hundreds of thousands of years of art and science collaboration, um, still 
embeds itself in these notions of deep time and, and, and even paleontology of media. He borrows the notion from Stephen Day Gould as a way to emphasize the primacy of variation. In the stratif stratified historical layers, geological time offered firstly a massive extension to the biblical, theologically tuned time that had governed European life for an extended period. Geological time was instead of the thousand years of times of, of well, thousands of years was an age of millions of years. <laughs> a time that was deep, stratified in the planet, and readable through the fossils that were signals across time layers. Obviously, the 19th century trope was about readability of the Earth. Nowadays, in the context of more um, computational and other sorts of analysis methods, we talk about the signals. Gould's more recent addition was to emphasize that variation persists. Is the primacy of variation in, even in such steaming, seemingly stable formations as layers of the Earth. Something that Zielinski wants to emphasize as a way to divert from what he calls the psychopathological normalization of media capitalism and its design models. For him, it leads to that idea that we know from media archaeology that the past is a rich um, resource or rich way of actually opening up instead of thinking that we, um, instead of, 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 of focusing on the present or the future scales, and overturns these temporal scales in new ways. But what I'm interested in is a more literal take, and in that sense, more geopolitical take. What if instead of the metaphorical deep times that do tell very inspiring stories of pre-Socratic philosophers, alchemists, early experiments in sound and vision technologies, we also would tell stories of chemicals and minerals and rocks and geophysics as one pertinent condition of existence of technical media. In one way, it's a sort of an anonymous history, at least one told of perspectives of the minerals, not merely a media history of how we communicate, a media history of writing and images, but one that spans much further than the thousands of years since the invention of cuneiform on clay tablets and other forms of inscription that feature in media histories? What if the media historical is now, by way of scientific analysis and the use and abuse of planetary resources, becoming itself part of Earth history? The millions of years of Earth history of minerals and energy resources, paleolithic layers, the carbon fossil energy forms, firing, still so many of data farms, despite search for more renewable energy forms for information. Such takes on the prehistory or proto-media history has not been much addressed despite the burgeoning amount of work and how it of course builds on very strong tradi traditions in, in, in um, non-human um, philosophy. Indeed, media materiality has been mostly focused on hardware and devices. And here, the pejorative use of technological determinism to refer, to refer to the fact that we haven't perhaps been um, detailed enough in how where, where materiality starts. In some early cases, we had histories of technology that included such material resource angles as well. I'm thinking of these rather curious cases that we might want to reintroduce part of this consideration. Aptly, Louis Mumford spoke of the early, in the early 20th century, Louis Mumford spoke of paleotechnical revolution or threshold that formed an essential part of the early history of technological modernization. The focus on mines as a site of technology came out in less, at least in two ways. <coughs> Both the economic mobilization of resources and capital to build massive mines and the significance of what Munford called the first completely inorganic environment to be created and lived in by man. Far more inorganic than the giant city that Spengler, as in Oswald Spengler, has used as symbol of the last stages of me mechanical desiccation. Munford continues, field and forest and stream and ocean are the environment of life. The mine is the environment of, alone of ores, minerals and metals. So it kind of, I mean, um, it's a wonderful, Rosalind Williams's book is a wonderful kind of a cultural history of this trope of the underground, how it persists, um, um, it kind of intensifies across 19th century and then of course persists still, the trope of the underground, um, both in terms of how it's a fantasy of the underground devoid of life and yet inhabited, um, continues in 19th century 
very literally in the massive infrastructures underground in urban environments, but of course also submarine cables, for instance. But the issues of mines and mining and minerals come out clearest in Mumford's early analysis. The early coal and what he calls the paleo phase is succeeded in his account by his, another term, neotechnics. The age of lighter materials of electricity and emerging advanced media and technologies of late 19th century and early 20th century. What's more, he already tells us what we thought we had discovered only now in the midst of the Anthropocene. He speaks about minerals. It's already in his account from 1930s that he recognizes that the new technological period it was one of new power sources, petroleum, and the transportability of petroleum, but also of rare metals and metallic earths as he describes. He speaks of tantalum, tungsten, thorium, cerium, iridium, platinum, and so forth. This was, of course, before the birth of electronic society. And yet, he recognized these elements as those kind of micro scales which actually around which our bigger issues that we talk about now also in terms of Anthropocene actually unfold. These more concrete situations in which the whole situation seemed to be as if condensed. Elements such as selenium, useful for automatic counting devices, electric door openers. And there's something interesting here in terms of this focus. I'm wondering if I should show it now. It's a kind of it's a funny example. If we've got time, I might show it as well. Because it relates to this persistence of these inorganic materials and minerals and metals as well that seem to be haunting this um, notion of the Anthropocene in so many ways as well. But at the same time, it's also mobilized in a rather odd way by exactly the problem, i.e. the digital corporations such as Apple. In more recent, one of the most recent types of, has of course been Apple Watch, where they, in one of the marketing videos, they mobilize this sense of the metallurgical, not in the kind of inspiring sense of Deleuze and Quatsari, but in the rather fetishized sense of refinement of metals as part of their digital corporate strategies. Let's see if I've got it somewhere. <coughs> it's got sound, but we don't need it, it's okay. I'll just show you very, very briefly. You'll find it online anyway. Yeah, it's just from here. You won't be able to hear it properly. We wanted to appeal to a wide range of personal styles. So with Apple Watch Edition, we're working with a uniquely luxurious metal, 18 karat solid gold. We're using both yellow and rose gold. Each is a custom alloy designed to be not only beautiful, but up to twice as hard as standard gold. It begins at the molecular level, where precise adjustments in the amount of silver, copper and palladium in the alloy result in very specific hues of yellow and rose gold. Next, we use a new hardening process developed by our metallurgists to strengthen a metal that is naturally very soft. The molten gold is cast, not into the shape of the watch, but into solid ingots. These ingots are then precisely milled to remove any imperfections. They're then compressed to a fraction of their original size, creating dense, pore-free bits. Ultrasonic scanners are used to detect even the most minute defects in the metal. From these solid billets, we machine the watch housing, as well as individual components, like the digital crown. I'm going to finish there because yeah, you got the point anyway. Um, there's something in terms of this kind of visual production or aesthetics having to do with this pore-free surface, but also the way in which it kind of plays out in relation to digital corporate um, 
marketing rhetorics also plays with these allusions to alchemy and but at the same time forefronting quite blatantly what it's all about metals and technological processes of 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 of, of manipulation of, of of these certain materials right so the metallurgical returns, not in the form of alchemy, but the more systematized forms of learning about the qualities of materials, is not merely a realization by Deleuze and Quattari that the metallurgical is a key to understanding the technological, but the wider geopolitical and indeed media technological theme that seems to persist, both in terms of new materials or then old materials, but also in the centrality of scrap metals both for Mumford, who was re already then recounting statistics from the early 20th century that half of the burden of open hearth furnaces in the United States alone is scrap metal, and the current moment of scraps, both essential for the construction business as well as the scraps removed from discarded electronics. Hence, its themes of scrap, dispossession, and such that start to define this perspective to the Anthropocene. A term that is on the one hand defined by its relation to science and technology from its start, and it's all about chemistry, right? And, af and after all, concretely an age of different chemical compositions of the planet. And on the other hand, the political economy of uneven distribution of wealth, but uneven distribution of waste in so many ways, both in terms of labor, but also in terms of the rather concrete chemical residual. After we have learned that just... Um, oh, let me see. After we have learned that just 90, com 90 companies cause two-thirds of man-made global warming emissions, we need to start thinking exactly again about this uneven distribution. Unfortunately, it doesn't even only translate as rich versus poor, or the corporations that are sucking energy from us, but also, even if we find the usual su suspects of global oil companies among the most troubling of emission-heavy mo fossil moguls, and it would same theme would run across all industries that are somehow essential to this Anthropocene situation. Indeed, as Naomi, Naomi Oreskes points out, also in countries such as Mexico, Poland, and Venezuela, we have very high levels of emissions, and continues to remind that it's not just about rich against the poor, of course, but on top of that, producers versus consumers, resource rich versus the resource poor, and the complex situation in which these divisions overlap. The constant differentiation of what we usually call the anthropos. The, compli the complication, complicated situation takes into account much more than simple polar opposites, and indeed includes various other notions. Also, gender is where the cultural theoretical coordinates should work upon. The planetary, not merely about the planet in the singular, but about the multiple situations and divisions which contribute to the situation. And I was thinking that I would gradually go towards the end, but I'm, I'm going to briefly talk through a different section just so that we get the connection to um, Tim's and earlier talk about art and aesthetics, even if my talk is not as refined because I'm just going to want to point out a couple of themes, and, but they might be actually in kind of a nice resonance what we talked about as well earlier. It's very slightly different angle um, to the whole um, theme of, of, of media arts, of geophysics. And I, it won't take too long. Um, so basically, speaking of art and design, many recent years art projects, as we heard, have been addressing these shifting scales of reference when it comes to media and technology and the Anthropocene, and the questions of the material basis of, let's say, vision or visual, visuality. We could speak about the environmental, that would be a decent word for it, an environmental turn in media arts, something that was recognized by Margaret Morse already years ago. Um, I remember a talk of hers. But more accurately, many, many projects are dealing with how questions of natural, artificial, and the political entangle. In other words, the invention of this notion of geology of media is actually preceded by many artworks and artistic methods that seem to be very aware of these issues of the changing material basis around which art takes place, art as a material practice. So in the book I, I, I talk 
about variety of projects, from Trevor Packland's work to the concept of, concept of psychogeophysics, um, Martin Hauser and Jonathan Kemp's work to Craig Richardonsky's installation art, Katie Patterson's um, wonderfully inspiring art practices um, that also problematize that any strict borders between natural and artificial in the context of uh, transmission and memory. Um, I just came from Vienna where they are hosting the Rare Earth exhibition, which is a good example again of the same themes of addressing art practice or theme of materiality through a rare earth um, 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 elements. Um, so there would be a lot there. Um, in a way, Douglas Kahn's wonderful book, Earth Sound, Earth Signal, did a lot of the ground for work for this already. Um, even if his focus, and this is not from the book, it's not related to that, sorry. Um, by focusing on sound arts, but writing a natural history of media and sound arts from the perspective of electromagnetism. This was already one context around which I want to talk about geology or write about geology as well, to think of what would be the complementary story in relation to geological materialities as well. Again, this is where we overlap with the notions of Anthropocene. Exemplary are, of course, as we quite often mention, Trevor Packland's work on space junk in last pictures. Issues of soil and earth as a medium are addressed, both in some of the recent Otolith groups' work, but also by such engineer alchemist artists, such as Martin Hauser, who works on these notions of um, telluric currents and earth boot and planetary as part of our media technological assemblages. But I want to mention briefly a less, less well-known project as well. And this is, again, something that actually, where we are talking to him, I was kind of starting to think about those notions of surface and depth as well. And so I thought there might be something there. So a less known project by um, Abelardo Gilles Fournier is interested, who is interested in technology, color, and materiality. He presents a piece at the intersection of mineral worlds and human vision geological materiality, and digital encoding. He takes Vladimir Vernatsky's early 20th century statement that we are walking, talking minerals to its logical conclusion, but relating it to vision and visual technologies. Fournier is, investigates by way of his installation that I'll show a short clip from soon, the copper basis of modern media technologies. The infrastructural layering of telecommunications in copper is resurfaced in the work through an augmented reality display through a smartphone, one that discovers the hidden message in that copper plate, so to speak, or the copper slab. The words by the Roman historian Tacit, perhaps striking or perhaps just way too often quoted, where they create a dessert, they call it peace. In other words, we return to the theme of war. In the piece, Mineral Vision, the question of visibility becomes problematized. And I'll show you a short clip. It's a very, very simple piece in itself, but it's, um, there's something about the surface that intrigues me. It's clear how he plays with the idea of mystical traditions and these ideas of messages hidden in rocks and stones. Roger Cayua wrote quite a long time ago the book um, Writing of Stones, where he kind of uh, investigated from the anthropological perspective this, this, this mythology or mystical side of rocks and stones. But see, Fournier seems to be somehow using that in the context of contemporary digital vision systems as well playing with this idea for surface um, that also at the same time both enable vision but also obscure vision. 
The question of visibility becomes problematized. One could say it becomes deterritorialized. The autonomous sensing systems that scan landscapes and create alternative visual representations by way of machine vision are not designed or are sometimes even for visible for the human eye. They instead create a sense of layers, a sense of layers of secret worlds of vision that return, as said, a mysticist feeling at the center of technological systems. And it's only hinted at by way of an augmented reality application. And yet he's insisting that this is also grounded in the mineral, or in this case, more literally, copper material, itself an asignifying and yet completely necessary part of these vision systems. He said, um, according to Fournier, copper, a basic element within the digital infrastructure, appears in the forefront as a material presence, raw and alinguistic. Instead of an industrial exploitation of minerals and humans, the electronic dialogue is an encounter of scales and durations, the geologic and the human. In a way, this idea returns us to where we began with. The geological as one, of our, one articulation of the multiple scales of, of entangled histories, times and memories. Of course, historians such as Fernand Prodel might have been at the forefront of recognizing how changes in the physical landscapes and geography are entangled with human histories. His prime example was the Mediterranean. Mediterranean, of course, is at the center of our geopolitics and the human suffering, as we know, over the past weeks, especially of the heightened focus in terms of immigra immigrants and the ghastly response by European Union to the situation. But we're also recognizing how issues of technology are mobilizing literally mobilizing metals and minerals and earth in most concrete ways. Again, as said, this is not a metaphorical way of thinking about mobilization. It underlines the most concreteness, the concreteness in those processes of deterritorialization and reterritorialization. Concrete operations of shifting land masses. I want to end by way of one more image. At the beginning of the talk, I was already thinking of something else. In Giuliolo's piece, I had already brought to mind the opening of Michel Serre's book about the natural contract. In Serre's short take, and very characteristic of his interest in poetics of scientific culture, he offers a take on not so much the social contract, but an extended version that speaks to the non-human animals and environmental processes. In other words, instead of merely the social contract that binds assumed social and human elements by way of its tightening cords, it is also natural manifested in many forms from geological to chemical that binds and frames, tightens and traps as part of a rethinking of community. He starts the book by, with this image by Goya, the fight with cudgels. And according to Serre, reminding of the excluded third that pertains to war or in this case, the two battling sides so focused on each other and their dispute, not noticing the ground that sucks them in bit by bit. It might be a rather apt, perhaps grim, parallel to our environmental discussions, and it's definitely a suitable parallel to injure Liolu's idea of the silent tracing of the scientific warfare and the human remains that soil registers, but also something that extends part of multiple histories in which we are sucked in. For the geological environment, the soil, but more so the minerals and other earth materials that are not merely under our feet anymore, they're not under our feet and sucking us in, but already in our devices, in the infrastructures, and implied in acts of seeing and hearing in the age of advanced, often computational machines. Is that the quicksand in terms of near imperceptible third, the parasitical, the environmental, but also that is solely sucking in death that manifests itself through electronic waste, the residual of conditions of existence of high technological culture of communication. So again, perhaps it is apt to talk about no man's land, but at the same time many machines land and also to specify about what we mean when we talk about man or men, again, being aware of gender implications as well, and not forgetting um, the other stories. But also which speak of geology and the story of aesthetics, bound with earth, not merely the sort of aesthetics that German romantics, romanticism of the 19th century 
many of them trained as mining engineers, were writing and sang singing about. But the aesthetics that is under and on the visible surface is the life of minerals in their multiple manifestations as light and sound, but also as labor and residual waste. It's the story of the earth in bits and pieces, after and before the human. Thank you.